Civil War, the Air Force was born. And as early as 1898, the War Department showed interest in the glider. But it took a pair of clever bicycle makers who tinkered with a man-carrying kite to add imagination and power. Wilbur and Orville Wright gave the glider a water-cooled engine of their own design and two chain-driven eight-and-a-half-foot pusher propellers. The toss of a coin in 1903 at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, won Orville Wright the chance to be the first man in history to fly under power. Air time, 12 seconds. Distance, less than the length of a B-36 wing. Wilbur Wright went to Europe in 1908 to find a market for the flying machine, which up to then, they were unable to sell. His flights on the continent attracted the president of France, as well as the kings of England, Spain, and Italy. To Wilbur, it was endless work. In addition to acting as pilot, he was ground crew, mechanic, and salesman. A team of horses pulled the plane to a wooden monorail. This was to serve as a runway on the grassy field. Lifted by a few men, the flying machine was swung into position facing the wind. To provide thrust for the takeoff, the Wrights had developed a weight-falling catapult. After the props were spun, the engine kicked over. Wilbur and his passenger, a French journalist, took seats on the lower wing and braced themselves for an exciting ride. He convinced Europe, winning applause, but no sale. Back in America, encouraged by President Teddy Roosevelt, the War Department opened bids for a heavier-than-air flying machine. Signal Corps specifications required that it carry two persons a distance of 125 miles at an average speed of 40 miles an hour. The Wright signed a stiff contract. Finally, at Fort Myer, Virginia, they flew a machine that was accepted as U.S. Army Airplane Number 1. By 1913, 41 Army pilots were decorated with these gold military aviator wings. Among them was Lieutenant Henry Arnold, who later, as commanding general of the AAF, led two and a half million airmen to victory. Another aviation pioneer, Glenn Curtis, also built early Army trainers. Soon, more inventors improved the machine with tractor instead of pusher propellers and the Army began to see the new airplane emerge as a weapon. By 1916, our only trained aviators were a few Americans flying with France, and they made us proud. They were the famous Lafayette Escadrille, started by Norman Prince, William Thaw, Victor Chapman, and Bert Hall, who courageously fought when Germany had full control of the sky over Europe. When German U-boats forced us to declare war, American air power ranked 14th. Believe me, we were far from ready. I was a rookie cadet, I ought to know. They gave us wooden guns and told us we were going to turn the tide. You know, in a couple of weeks, we began to look as though we might do it. For training equipment, we molded our own bombs out of plaster. Pretty soon, we trained with the real things, Lewis machine guns. Having met the requirements, we were issued leather flying togs and helmets. Assignments were made, and we got a chance to fly. First, we made a pre-flight check of the bailing wire planes. Then, we tried our wings. Fifty hours in the air, a few bombs. We were checked out, ready for advanced training overseas. America was producing airmen, but we didn't have a single fighting airplane. Only a few of our leaders were wise. Newton Baker, Secretary of War, was one. He insisted, Supremacy of the air in modern warfare is essential. Woodrow Wilson was another. 
The president asked for $600 million to meet the needs of military aviation. Meanwhile, Red Cross girls saw us off on our way overseas. Since Congress couldn't vote us time, we went to France without airplanes. But we did go in style. Camouflaged luxury liners like the Leviathan were used as troop ships. Some of us half-trained flyers went to Britain and Italy, but most of us went to France. There, we found cities of wooden barracks and muddy streets. In outdoor classes, we practiced gunnery. Wooden models helped us learn how to lead a plane with our fire. Battle-tested aviators took time out from the war to show us how to handle the stick. Finally, we soloed. The first ride was always a thrill and a bumpy experience. However, it was much easier to talk about turning the tide than to produce fighting aces overnight, even if some of us were lucky. Late in 1917, France met the AEF's first Aero Squadron, commanded by Major Ralph Royce. His outfit was the first to see action, and they proudly pasted paper iron crosses over enemy bullet holes. Our commander was Colonel Billy Mitchell, America's first flyers were there. General Benjamin Falloy in command of supply and schools. Colonel Thomas Milling, head of air service units, 1st Army. And Colonel Frank Lahm for the 2nd Army, commanded by General Bullard. When Major William Thor and the Lafayette Escadrille became the 103rd Aero Squadron, they brought a record of triumphs. Thor, five German planes down. Lieutenant Larner, three. Lieutenant Merrick, one. Lieutenant Tobin, three. Don't forget the aces. Captain Field Kindley with 12 victories, and Major Raoul Luffberry with 17, before they were both grounded forever. Then those who lived to take part in another war, Captain Elliot Springs with a score of 12, and the ace of aces, hat of the ring Captain Eddie Rickenbacker with 26 victories. America's airplane factories and us war workers didn't get started until late. To make airplane wings, they took us house carpenters, furniture upholsterers, even seamstresses with high pompadour. Meet Rosie the Riveter, 1917. Painters use varnish that smell like bananas. The fuselage, which we finally chose, was of British design. The engine was all American. The manufacture was the outstanding production achievement of the war. In all, 4,500 DH-4 airplanes powered by the Liberty engine were put together in this country. They were built by Ford, Lincoln, Cadillac, and Packard, automobile manufacturers. Curtis, Martin, and Wright, still famous plane-making names, were busy assembly plants in those days. World War I gave America its great aircraft industry. Each plane was test flown. Then, the thousands of parts were painstakingly dismantled for packing under guard. Crated and addressed, it was off to the front. In France, husky mademoiselles handled the wings like toys. Here, parts were reassembled into the fighting craft, which helped sweep the enemy out of the sky. May 1918, and the first American DH-4s rolled directly from assembly sheds to the airfields. Only eight months after they were ordered into production, they joined American aviators ready for the big push. When the order to prepare for battle was given, truckloads of aerial bombs were delivered to the planes. There, armorers fused the bombs and loaded the racks. Then the boys who had to take them up made sure the job was done right. The boys still talk about the big push. When we lifted the flaps that September morning in 1918, everything was ready. Billy Mitchell had asked for every Allied airplane that could fight. We brought them out. 
The brass ordered a tremendous air force to control the skies over the Samahil sector. This was the first Army's field of battle. For the dawn takeoffs, we put flares on our wingtips. Every Allied field on the continent gave its planes. General Mitchell called for 1,500. We actually got 1,481 off the ground. Wooden props spit into the air, and the engines began to rev up. Our mission was to protect the doughboys of the 1st Army. Some had orders to bomb and strafe enemy installations, others to engage the Germans in the air. This was it. Each pilot had been carefully briefed for his part in the mission. U.S. aviators in 609 American planes, now a solid part of Allied air power, rose to attack. Germany put albatrosses, Fokkers, more than 30 different types of planes in action to fly no man's land patrols. Some of the Huns dropped bombs by hand on our troops. With over 120 different types of aircraft, the Allies fought back. Our boys were always quick to single out the enemy and come in close to attack. The German was hurt. He tried to escape but couldn't make it. Our pilot signaled that he had made another kill. And after a victory roll, he rejoined his buddies. Other enemy ships strafed our observation balloons, burning them out of the sky. Allied air power struck back in force. The sky was a beehive of battle. We overwhelmed their air defense, winning and holding air superiority. It was almost the same a few weeks later in the Meuse-Argonne offensive, where we bombed with telling effect in the most notable aerial effort of the war. November 11, 1918, closed a chapter in the unending story of the United States Air Force. Visual history has shown us some of the courageous men in uniform and out who cradled the dream of flight and gave us aviation. In the history-making jobs that lay ahead is the inspiring chronicle of more Americans who continued the pioneer spirit. Men with an idea who planned and worked and fought to build the greatest striking force and protective power in history, the United States Air Force. November 11th, 1918. Everyone celebrated the armistice in the Times Squares of the world. While victory flags still waved, America cut the Army Air Service 95%, making it a skeleton force. In France, our airmen had earned the admiration of the Allies, but economy only permitted a handful to rejoin the post-war ranks. Fortunately, among them were Mitchell, Brereton, Spots, Arnold, and other future Air Force leaders. Many airmen, such as Captain Eddie Rickenbacker, left the service and adjusted themselves to the rigors of civilian life. A few became world famous, like Air Captain Fiorella LaGuardia. For those who stayed in, there was immediate need for their activities. To inaugurate the U.S. Airmail Service, which was pioneered by the Army, President Wilson escorted the First Lady. The Postmaster General picked one of us Army pilots to be the first to fly the mail. For the benefit of the Red Cross, the President had addressed a letter to the Postmaster of New York City. Witnesses watched the famous first airmail letter being posted. Lack of instruments and navigation maps made flying tough, but we hoped jobs like this would increase public confidence in our ability. With the mail sacked up and ready to go, Wilson and the pilot discussed the proposed flight. 
Meanwhile, the four mail sacks were stashed away in the open cockpit under the president's friendly gaze. Then the pilot climbed aboard, little dreaming that less than 22 miles from Washington, he'd get lost. Later, the first air mail was delivered by another pilot who followed the railroad tracks to New York. Another army assignment for men who stayed in uniform was forest fire patrol. Quick detection brought about important savings in the nation's timber. But in those days, the one who most often captured the public's eye was the war-trained flyer who took up barnstorming. With a $50 surplus trainer and a complete disregard for the law of gravity, he worked in a drafty office only a few seconds a day. To wildcats like Howard Hawks, Roscoe Turner, and Stinson goes much credit for introducing America to the sky. Even the obsolete pusher condemned by the Army before the war helped popularize aviation, develop airfields, and add to the knowledge of flying. The crowds love to watch the daredevils outdo each other with spectacular stunts. The steady flying, easy to handle Jenny, standard army trainer was the barnstormer's favorite perch. Although some of the more reckless civilian flyers gave aviation a black eye, most of them helped America lead the world toward the air age. Wherever there was business enough, the gypsy flyer settled down. He bought a bigger plane, rented a larger cow pasture, and often gave free rides, especially to the ladies. Rides with every modern convenience. Eventually, there grew up the private intercity taxi services, which flew millions of miles, direct ancestors of today's big commercial lines. After the war, Congress set up the air service as a permanent combat element and permitted training to start again. We studied aerial photography. As the eyes of the Army, one of the air service's primary missions was reconnaissance. The main tool was a high-speed aerial camera. After the pictures were taken, the glass plates were developed. Then a lab man made contact prints. Finally, these overlapping pictures were cut up and pasted down as a mosaic. Some of us were briefed for our first mission, strafing maneuvers. This strafing mission was against ground troops armed with anti-aircraft. With the help of the ground crews, we started the takeoff. Still based on wartime practices, the training program was in three parts. Primary, basic, advanced. In advanced, we specialized in bombardment, observation, pursuit, or attack. When they heard our engines roar, the troops ran for cover. Flying through their anti-aircraft fire, we strafed the enemy. A mule-drawn ak-ak blazed away. The Army maintained an active, though limited, interest in a lighter-than-air program. At a school in Scottfield, Illinois, men train for work with free as well as semi-rigid balloons. AEF success with observation blimps inspired Army interest in non-rigid and semi-rigid airships for 20 years into the future. Air Service Chief General Charles Menaher took pride in showing flight training to General Reed, Commandant, 5th Army Corps. Together, they watched Major Carl Spott signal 18 pursuit crews to prepare for a mass graduation review. This was the big moment after more than a year of the toughest training in the world. As the newest members of the Air Service, they took off to do their part in building America's early air power. It was a magnificent sight to see these squadrons take possession of the air. Flying safety was a constant goal, and development of a life-saving parachute which the early birds could trust was high on the list of equipment being researched. This test called for jumping off the wing backwards. Another method was having the slipstream open the chute and yank a man off the wing. 
Although parachutes had been offered by the service of supply for some time, our men didn't use them. To prove that the equipment worked, many of the test jumps were made by the inventors themselves. Despite budget setbacks, the Air Service continued to make aviation history with record-breaking flights. Lieutenants Kelly and McCready won congratulations from the Dean of All Flyers, Orville Wright, for setting several duration and distance records in the famous T-2, a hot ship. For the first non-stop coast-to-coast -coast flight, the Air Service modified a giant commercial transport with special tanks in the wings. This was the third try by the same men in the same plane. Two previous west to east hops had failed. In preparing the plane, 780 gallons of gas were pumped aboard. By flying from east to west, they hoped to use up most of the gas load before climbing the Rockies. This was not a stunt. John McCready and Oakley Kelly were part of a larger Army program to develop better planes, engines, and navigation, and to advance flying techniques. As the prop was spun, history took note of May 2nd, 1923, as a memorable day. One of the tensest moments was the takeoff. Would the monoplane, now weighing 10,000 pounds, clear the Curtis hangars at the far end of the field? It did. Throughout the 2,250-mile route, the pilots took turns at the controls. Average speed, 94 miles an hour. Less than 27 hours later, the T-2 arrived over Rockwell Field, San Diego. After spanning a continent, the huge plane and its two-man crew settled down to Earth. And the single Liberty engine now taxied the T-2 on California soil toward the excited crowds. By covering the greatest distance ever made in a single cross-country flight, Kelly and McCready proved that eventually, in a national emergency, troops could be transported from one coast to another in little more than a day. In the early 20s, chief proponent for the value of air power was Brigadier General Mitchell. Since his return from France, he had insisted that an airplane could sink any surface ship. And when he argued that one half the cost of a single new battle wagon could supply the planes to make the warship obsolete, Congress insisted he get the chance to prove it. For the tests, Billy Mitchell hastily assembled a force, including some Navy flyers, which he trained at Langley Field, Virginia. He taught them the same bombing techniques which he had learned in World War I. Engines were started, and the first provisional air brigade took off for a mission which was to test the future of military aviation. Fast pursuits and heavy bombers accompanied by auxiliary planes with cameras and observers headed for the latest target, a U.S. battleship. By new tests conducted on the obsolete Alabama, Mitchell tried to clinch his claims. Through the use of phosphorus bombs, he demonstrated the fine art of precision bombing. Perfect hit. This was expert pinpoint bombing. Heavier bombs were now prepared by the armorers of the Air Brigade, and the SS Shawmut radioed orders for the new takeoffs. Power men signaled the heavy bombers, and again they displayed the same remarkable precision. But the Joint Board was still unconvinced even when more bombs finally sank the Alabama. Two years later, Billy Mitchell and his men prepared for a new series of battleship bombing tests, this time against the obsolete battle wagons, New Jersey and Virginia. On the deck of the San Mahil were General Pershing, Admiral Shoemaker, Assistant Secretary of War Davis, and the new Air Chief, General Patrick. The 1923 tests attracted even more widespread public and official attention. The target sat and waited for a 2,000-pound bomb to be dropped from 10,000 feet. The Air Service was learning that a near miss was the body blow that weakened the hull. 
setting up a target for the knockout punch. Mitchell's air brigade was becoming more and more expert and could lay those eggs anywhere. A photo plane recorded everything on film. The beginning of the end of a mighty warship victim of precision bombing. A direct bomb strike had cleared the decks and armor plate buckled like a tin can. By showing her keel, the Virginia proves she's had enough. And she's on her way to join the other test victims, German sub U-117, destroyer G-102, light cruiser Frankfurt, and battleship Ostfriesland, as well as U.S. battleships Alabama and New Jersey. Air power versus sea power. The tests were a brilliant success, even if many years were to go by before their significance was fully appreciated. For 10 years after the armistice, the job handed America's air service was a secondary one, support of the ground forces. Although later chapters in the Air Force story show the growth of the nation's air arm was inevitable, skeptics persisted in trying to stop progress. Thus, it was a slow and difficult climb to be allowed a more positive role in national defense and eventually to prove, like Billy Mitchell did, the power punch of strategic bombardment and the peace power of the United States Air Force. Nineteen twenty-four. The entire nation, as well as the crowds in Boston Harbor, waited to cheer the first round-the-world flyers. The U.S. Air Service, struggling with a few men, a handful of planes, and very little money, hoped these spectacular achievements would help win public support. Even though it took six months for the sturdy biplanes to circle the Earth, the Air Service was making a victim of space. Traversing more than 27,000 miles, they had flown through every weather on Earth. The conquering heroes, led by Lieutenant Lowell Smith, succeeded where all others had failed and at long last returned home. These six, Harding, Nelson, L.P. Arnold, Wade, Ogden, and Smith, together had reduced the size of the Earth under the leadership of Mitchell and General Patrick new chief of the air service. At the same time, we developed the Barling Bomber. For crew, we had pilots Lieutenants Harris and Muir Fairchild, the designer Barling and engineer Culver. They climbed through the hatch of the monster, which had been shipped to right field in sections. These men were taking a big step toward realizing Billy Mitchell's strategic bombing theories. From his open cockpit, the commander surveyed the man of war and ordered his crew chief to start the six Liberty engines. Four of these were tractors, while two worked as pushers. With everything checked, the pilot gave the signal to taxi toward the takeoff point on the grassy runway. A barling had three wings, which spanned 120 feet, and it stood 27 feet high, dwarfing all air service planes of the time. Meet the Super Dreadnought, biggest attempt at a long-range, load-carrying heavy bomber. In fact, this was the largest ever built in the United States up to then. During construction, it raised many eyebrows because the plane cost somewhere near a half a million dollars. A very high cost for a new airplane idea when the total air service budget was so small. The experimental triplane clumsily started its takeoff for the first time in 1923. 32,000 pounds traveling along at the incredible speed of 61 miles an hour. When it couldn't climb over the Appalachian Mountains, the barling was grounded and was used to solve engineering problems. It certainly influenced development of the B-17. The next year, President Coolidge looked for the Pan American Goodwill Flyers to land at Bowling Field, Washington. After they had flown 22,000 miles and had visited 25 sister republics, Major Herbert Dargue and his crew were welcomed back to the U.S. The president awarded each flyer a Distinguished Service Cross certificate in a ceremony attended by the cabinet. 
The new Air Corps chief congratulated the flyers, including future Air Force generals, Lieutenant Ennis Whitehead and Captain Ira Aker. Thus, the Air Corps had demonstrated its diplomatic value to the nation. Also in 1926, Frederick Patterson, head of a group of Ohio businessmen, broke ground for Wright Field. Two years later, Orville Wright raised the flag for our dedication ceremony in the distinguished company of many notables and aviation names. Together, they hallowed the ground for the Air Corps Materiel Division, which was going to build the greatest flying field in the world, near Dayton, home of aviation. America couldn't have had better representation than Orville Wright, Secretary of War Davis, Judge Kennesaw Landis, Assistant Secretary Truby Davison, Air Corps Chief General Patrick, and many others. From the steps of the new headquarters, they witnessed the gun salute. Squadrons of the latest planes passed in review and hailed Wright Field. Another distinguished Army flight was the first non-stop attempt from California to Hawaii. Ground crews carefully prepared the huge tri-motor Air Corps monoplane called the Bird of Paradise. She was going to fly an untried course mapped out by Lieutenants Maitland and Hagenberger. Oakland Airport crowds applauded the two Army flyers as they gunned their engines and started off down the long runway. Hundreds of gallons of gas made a heavy and dangerous load. Finally, the bird of paradise lifted itself off the earth and headed for 2,400 miles of nothing but motion. Navigation was the chief problem. Using instruments he had designed and developed himself, Hagenberger guided Maitland straight to their goal, an island in the vast Pacific. Less than 26 hours later, the people of Hawaii hurried to get a look at the first airplane flown from the States. Maitland and Hagenberger had made it. Seems that almost everyone in Honolulu came out to say aloha to the two tired but happy men who had spanned the Pacific. This was later regarded as the most perfectly organized and completely planned flight ever attempted. Hagenberger and Maitland triumphantly returned to the States by boat. In the 20s, the Army watched Americans stunt flying the oceans. Charles Lindbergh, Will Rogers and Wiley Post, Amelia Earhart, and many others. The Air Corps learned from successes as well as failures, like this overloaded civilian takeoff. Luckily, Ruth Elder and her pilot were only slightly injured. In the search for greater range, very important to air defense, we sent up the famous question mark to try mid-air refueling, another in the Army's never-ending chain of experiments. The idea was as simple as tapping a beer barrel at 70 miles an hour. First, the tanker plane let down a gas line. After a crewman aboard the question mark caught the hose, contact was made. This was done 43 different times in order to transfer 40 tons of gas, oil, food, batteries, and supplies. Nine of these delicate contacts were made at night. In all, 5,660 gallons of gasoline and 245 gallons of oil were transferred by this air-to-air -air refueling method. After completing a transfer, the question mark threw off the gas line, which was then pulled back into the tanker plane. The experiment continued successfully for nearly a week, breaking every endurance record known. When the question mark finally came down, it proved that a plane could fly 11,000 miles without stopping, and that U.S. Air Corps flight training was the best. Major Carl Spots and his crew, including two other future Air Force generals, were the champion endurance flyers of their time. This was the beginning of the idea that the Air Corps could deliver a payload anywhere on Earth. Even in 1929, the United States Air Arm had shown that strategic operations could be extended to cover half the globe. The question mark's engine showed only trivial wear. If it hadn't been for a plug grease outlet, who knows how many more days they could have stayed aloft. 
The rugged five-man team was made up of Staff Sergeant Huey, Lieutenant Pete Quesada, Lieutenant Harry Halverson, Captain Ira Aker, and Major Carl Spots. With questions answered, the question mark returned to its hangar. Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Royce, during the severe winter of 1930, led the first pursuit group flying Curtis Hawks through three weeks of exercises and sub-zero temperatures. This was a large-scale operation. For many years, the Air Corps was seriously engaged in cold weather tests for its men and machines. Their concern was with the ice-bound approaches to the American continent. Airplanes had already crossed the North Atlantic and the North Pacific. Eventually, why couldn't enemy aircraft follow the icy meridian straight over the top of the Earth? Just before one mission, a blizzard hit, freezing up the engines. The men found that crankcase oil became a solid mass. Maneuvers such as these demonstrated the vital need for a cold weather testing program. Skis were welded to the ice. Nevertheless, the crews persisted and they got the planes ready to fly. Under the most difficult field conditions and working in frigid temperatures without de-icers, without electrically heated suits and in open cockpits, the Army Air Corps trained to defend America. American air races started in 1920 and continued to focus public attention on flying for 19 years. Remember the 1925 Pulitzer contest? Our entry was a Curtis Hawk. General Patrick instructed Lieutenant Bettis as Jimmy Doolittle looked on. The Navy's entry was the same, except for the paint job and the pilot. Lieutenant Al Williams held the speed record and was confident of success. Bettis was the first to take off. On another section of the field, the ground crew straightened the Navy plane and Williams sped away. There goes the Army. It was a spectacular show around a closed course as Bettis picked up speed. First he equaled Williams' old record, then he went even faster. Williams dished out tough competition. Even before Bettis came in for his landing, everyone knew that the Army had won. The new speed king of the year was Cyrus Bettis, who averaged 249 miles an hour. The Navy entry averaged 242 miles an hour and was given second honors. Two weeks later, in the Schneider International Seaplane Race at Baltimore, Army was represented by Lieutenant Jimmy Doolittle. The Navy was in this one too. They both flew hawks fitted with floats. Britain entered a napier. Italy, a matchy. The float planes took to the sea. Doolittle was the first to respond to the signal. In the face of top-notch competition, Army was the first to cross the finish line, a 232 mile an hour winner. Cleveland Air Race crowds loved the Army maneuvers. The first pursuit group and the 17th attack group in spectacular operations. Lucky Lindy watched the Army write its initials in the sky. During the 20s, the Air Corps proved the airplane was more than a weapon. Although Army flyers had cut time and distance by flying higher, longer, and faster, this period was a constant struggle for recognition. These flights made Americans think about air power. Later chapters in the Air Force story will show the growing importance of the air arm for national defense. The uniting of the new power with America's great industrial capacity made it possible to prepare for the future and to speed the growth of the United States Air Force.
1930. Randolph Field was dedicated and a new Air Corps era began. One of the Army's first pilots, General Frank Lum, received congratulations as father of the West Point of the Air. It soon developed into one of the greatest air bases in the world. To this $10 million Texas Air City came headquarters for the Air Corps Training Center. Randolph eventually became the concrete nest where many of America's World War II eagles learned to fly. We held large-scale maneuvers in 1931 over the northeast quarter of the nation. Veteran flyer General Benjamin Floyd, who was to be named Chief of the Air Corps before the year was out, announced that this was the greatest concentration of Army Air Corps planes ever attempted. We had brought to Dayton, Ohio, almost 700 Martin, Keystone, and Curtis two-engine bombers backed by squadrons of swift Boeing P-12 pursuits. For a nine-day period in successful combat maneuvers, air crews practiced with all types of military aircraft, flying almost two million air miles. Outside San Antonio, Texas, the third attack group, one of Hoyt Vandenberg's early outfits, developed techniques to destroy enemy planes on the ground. For targets, they used Weary Willies, a polite name for worn out and obsolete aircraft. Each keystone dropped a string of three bombs. The lesson, enemy planes destroyed on the ground can never menace the skies. During the early 30s, President Hoover came to Bowling Field to decorate an ace. Air Corps Chief General James Fichet read the citation honoring Captain Eddie Rickenbacker for his heroism 12 years before in the battle skies over France. For two other heroes, the Air Corps dispatched a non-rigid airship to salute a majestic monument rising from a stone star on the highest of the Kill Devil Hill among the sand dunes near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Man's first successful flight was thus fittingly dedicated with a wreath from the sky. Here, the history of man's conquest of the air was inscribed in bronze and granite. At Washington ceremonies, only one brother was alive to hear the distinguished Flying Cross citation read by Assistant Secretary of War Truby Davison and to receive the certificates from Secretary of War Dwight F. Davis. Orville accepted for Wilbur as well as himself. Together, they had built a machine which influenced the course of history. While America engaged in peaceful pursuits, on the other side of the globe, the Japanese military machine was preparing for war. Her army and air force swarmed over Manchuria, and aggression exploded. Japanese airplanes and ground troops in the fall of 1931 began an unwarranted attack on Manchuria the beginning of world conflict. In the States, we agents of the Indian Bureau had asked the War Department to help us get food to the snowbound Navajo tribes in Arizona. The 11th Bomb Squad came to us from March Field. After the flyers wrapped these supplies in blankets and fastened them to the bomb shackles, they hung the mercy bundles inside the planes like bombs. Near a line of Curtis bombers, we pointed out the first trading post on the map. The pilots called it the target. It was easy to see that this winter of 32 was a man killer as we flew north past Navajo Mountain, traveling 133 miles an hour in open plains at zero temperatures. We searched the mesa. There it is, the big lodge in the middle of the staked fence. Flying low, the pilot put the B-2 Condor on the bomb run. Skimming over the foothills, it felt like we'd surely graze those trees on the ridge. There go the mercy bombs. It was magic. Machines designed for killing an enemy were saving our friend. We almost tripped on our own shadow as we waved goodbye and headed back. Agents on the scene reported that by dropping 15 tons of supplies, the Air Corps had saved entire families. Our aviators engaged in peaceful pursuits at the same time, there were war rumblings in Europe. While we flew missions of mercy, an ominous voice was threatening the peace of the world. Hard uns, nicht Deutschland, in uns, 
marschiert Deutschland und hinter uns kommt Deutschland. Many of us in America had made the mistake of laughing at this Adolf Hitler. From 1933 on, his leaders made their party day in the city of Nuremberg a tremendous spectacle. The Nazis had finally come into power. These very same kids were to face Allied armies, navies, and air forces only a short time later. Within six years, as Germany's Wehrmacht and Luftwaffe, they threatened the freedom of all the world. Back home in 1934, there was a conflict over charges that the United States Post Office Department was paying exorbitantly high rates to commercial lines for carrying the nation's airmail. Contracts were canceled, and by presidential direction, Postmaster General James A. Farley signed the order, turning the job over to the Army Air Corps, which had pioneered flying the mail. In obsolete planes, including open cockpit fighters and trainers, we maintain day and night airmail schedules. In spite of weather and the lack of equipment, the men of the Air Corps tackled the job as though flying the mail was a series of combat missions. Operating from airfields which still used World War I searchlights and flying without a beacon system, crashes were inevitable. The nation wondered how the Air Corps could ever carry bombs if it couldn't carry mail. But investigations disclosed that if we had been given the planes, personnel, and training funds for which we battled all those years, we could have done this or any job. The 30s also began to see a change in Army aircraft design. Sleek monoplanes, all metal construction. General Falloy had urged the aviation industry to compete in the building of a fast bomber. And Boeing delivered the 163 mile an hour B-9. The same year, Boeing took a powerful 600 horsepower Pratt & Whitney engine and strapped on the rugged 24-foot saddle. They called the result a P-26. These first all-metal pursuit monoplanes were still on hand nine years later when the Philippine Air Force tried to use them against the Japs. Pitted against the B-9, the Boeing fighter and bomber put each other through their paces. Kicking up a top speed of 230 miles an hour, it easily outstripped the B-9 bomber and many other planes of the period. Another entry in the bomber competition was Martin's early version of the B-10, also a twin-engine, all-metal monoplane. It had a waste gun, a nose gun, and an efficient bomb bay, which could close on a 2,000-pound argument. This armament, plus a 1,300-mile range, made it the most powerful bomber of the time, while its speed of 207 miles an hour made it the fastest in the world. An excellent trial for the new B-10s came in 1934, when Lieutenant Colonel Hap Arnold and Majors Hugh Nur and Ralph Royce led 27 officers and men on a long-range test flight. Take off, Washington, D.C. Destination, Fairbanks, Alaska. Mission, to fly over extensive Alaskan territory, photograph strategic landing areas, determine the feasibility of sending an Air Force to Alaska in an emergency, and report on frontier defense. On the return trip from Juneau to Seattle, the crews flew nonstop through fog and rainstorms 990 miles. Thus, as early as 1934, the Air Corps proved that it was technically possible for an enemy to bomb the United States from the Arctic. After reaching Washington, the Alaskan Flyers were honored at Bowling Field. Later, in new trials, the Army Air Corps set out to prove that B-10s could operate under extreme Arctic conditions. During backbreaking exercises, picked crews battled freezing equipment as they tried to operate their planes and weapons in sub-zero temperatures. Lessons learned in these cold weather tests proved invaluable seven years later when Japan reached for the United States via Alaska. 
While the new bombers had, in a sense, moved America's frontier to Alaska, they also demonstrated that should the need ever arise, this same frontier could receive aid by air. At West Point, where the Army's future officers were schooled, the only flight training for cadets up to June 1935 was the time they put in flying over the hurdles during cavalry maneuvers. But the class of 36 was the first to start aviation indoctrination. To Mitchell Field, New York, came 279 cadets in three separate groups under command of Air Training Officer Major Omar N. Bradley. Each group prepared to stay a week to get 20 hours of flying, along with extensive ground courses from Army and Air Corps experts like Air Officer Lieutenant Colonel Walter H. Frank. In this first detachment were future colonels Richard Carmichael, Clinton True, Gordon Austin, and Benjamin Davis, among others. They studied aircraft familiarization, gunnery, and engines. Before long, orders of the day called the names for the first flight. Down the line went the cadets, trailing their waltzing Matildas. Engines were warming up as the cadets climbed aboard, bucking the slipstream. Pilots took the controls and the line of obsolescent LB-6 bombers taxied off the hard stand. At Mitchell, the runway was a cleared field where the big planes formed a huge oval, treating the West Pointers to an Air Corps dress parade prior to taking off. After flying over New York City, the lead Keystone bomber headed due north toward the point. Gunnery familiarization was on the curriculum, as was instrument reading, cross country, formation flying, and navigation. En masse, the three flights roared up the Hudson River to salute the United States Military Academy at West Point. For the years between wars, the Army Air Corps continued to make progress, and U.S. Army Chief of Staff reports began to attach greater importance to military aviation. Squadrons exercised as real fighting units, with a general staff finally conceding that the air arm might be utilized for independent operations. As the next film chapter will show, hopes of big bomber advocates boom during a period of alarming developments on the world scene. In this prelude to war, weapons for American defensive strength and long-range striking power were being developed and proved by the United States Air Force. <laughs> 